All right, guys, break hard, rewind, back for another week. This week, we watched the 1996 Italian Grand Prix, the third to last race of the season. Michael Schumacher wins. The first one for Ferrari at Monza, I think since like 87, maybe? I believe that's what the broadcast said. Regardless, really solid race. Another good race from the 90s that we just randomly picked. Yeah. Out of that. And there is so much about this race and broadcast that I that I love so much. I wish that we still had some of the aspects today. Oh, big time. I mean, the 90s kind of aesthetic in and of itself uh, but sp- was great. But specific to racing meant so much tobacco money. Um, you know, that was that was the case as well in the 2001 Austrian Grand Prix. Um but man, seeing all those tobacco sponsors and all the different engine manufacturers, there are so many. I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six. Heart? Like, who's Heart? Yeah. <laughs> six different engine manufacturers? Seven with four. So, yeah, seven yeah. out of shit. What do we have? 20 cars, 22 cars, um, 21 cars. But yeah, that's insane. Yeah, there are so many engine manufacturers. Um, um, obviously, it feels like there were more constructors back then just because they're also all over the map. And it's kind of cool because you hear a lot of, like, classic names. Obviously, Williams was, was like, a world. they were world, be- world beaters back then, which we'll get to oh, them yeah. um, a lot. But, but just to see, like, the Williams of the world, even, I mean, the Liget up in the points, um, which is nice, uh, the Liget Musion Honda. <laughs> the Liget, excuse me, with the Musion Honda power. I'm assuming Musion is is uh, M U G N is pronounced like that, but um, yeah, it's great. Uh, great optics on this race. It's Japanese. That's like the. I don't know if they're still like the Honda. I don't want to call them like aftermarket, but like performance division. But that's what yeah. it used to be. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Everything about this race, though, from from just the start of you know, both Williams smoking their, was it, yeah, Williams on the front row smoking their tires. Ferrari, Jean Alesi coming out of nowhere in the Benetton. And the Benetton wasn't, you know, the strongest car that year. And just storms to the lead. Ferrari having legitimate pitch strategy on top of a driver who every time you told him to put in a fast lap, he could just do it like a robot, which was unreal. awesome. To, yeah, unreal is probably the better word for it to watch. And then, like, McLaren was there, but they weren't, you know, back to Mc- full McLaren form yet. Jordan really well, uh, ran really well. Just the mix of things, teams in the 90s that we've watched the last two weeks now has been phenomenal. Well, yeah. 2001 to 96, but whatever. Right, right. I know what you, you meant. Yeah, it, it was cool. I mean, the uh, the Tifosi kind of, which is like the number one topping in every Italian Grand Prix ever. Uh, the Tifosi were out in full force, you know. Uh, Ferrari was kind of reascending to um to being the most dominant team out there um so it's really cool to kind of see that momentum as well um i don't don't think they were coming off some some really quality years so Mm -hmm. it was nice to see that but you know the tifosi had something else to cheer for with john alacy the recent ferrari driver uh having such a good run and uh obviously came on p2 but uh the chase the chase between he and schumacher was awesome that was fantastic my other favorite part of this was them talking about how bad Ferrari had been and how yeah. scared everybody else was in case they ever did become competitive again with Schumacher yeah. at the wheel. Like we'll talk about Williams in a minute, but they were the main ones that were like scared of the potential of a Ferrari Schumacher duo. But yeah, like you said, the fact that Jean Lacy could get out and pace the field, especially in a, in a Benetton that Schumacher got out of two years prior to yeah. move to Ferrari, which was a, world championship winning team when Schumacher left it. So that was awesome to watch, not only because like you have Schumacher in the, uh, in the Ferrari chasing him down, but like you also have his old team and you know, all that old, the great stuff, but just like the hunt and then yeah. the eventual pass. That was the best part for me. Cause like we, we see that from time to time still today, but like, you just knew that like he was just essentially stalking a Lacey. And then when the time came, he just pounced and yeah. annihilated him. Yeah, he really did. I mean, that, that was just like standard Schumacher greatness. And it's hard to believe he had already won two world championships at that point. 
I mean, I know. Um, and those, be- I've got to say, I always, because I always make a point about these things, no matter what the year, if it's 2020, I'd probably be saying, making a similar comment about some team. But the Benetton looked so good. That blue and white with a mild oh, seven yeah. branding. I mean, again, tobacco money. Uh, but and now, correct me if I'm wrong, but so Benetton is now, I mean, obviously they've evolved into multiple different forms under different names, but that's Renault, right? Yeah, they still actually use the same Enstone factory that Benetton made back in the day, back in the 90s, yeah. which is crazy That's awesome. to me that they're still using that. But um, I do love tracking Formula One teams that you know started as one thing, like Minardi is now Toro Rosso, which is just preposterous yeah. to me. And like Jaguar is now Red Bull. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy how the whole thing – I mean, fucking, Honda is now Mercedes? Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the one that blows my mind. And that, that was, like, I knew that, but they mentioned, they made mention of the Brackley factory and I mm-hmm. think the 2001 race. And then that's when the light bulb kind of like right now went off above my yeah. head. And I was like, Oh my God, that is like, I, you know, like I said, it just all came back together. Yeah. Uh, there was a good thing. I think it was on the Formula One subreddit yesterday of F1 shops, you know, like 20 years ago versus the factory. Yeah. Now. And like the McLaren one is the biggest difference because they were basically working out of some tool sheds and Woking, and now they're in this world-class, like, <laughs> spaceship over a lake, which is preposterous to look at, but yeah, yeah, just the fact of how everything has changed since then. Uh, I think the biggest talking point for this entire race was, oh, one other thing I want to point out about the broadcast, it was shown on ESPN2, so if you have the opportunity to go back and watch it, definitely do, but this is, like, in the first few years of ESPN2, when they were trying to be, like, the, the hip um, sports channel and yeah. everything was like I don't know if you noticed everything was in lowercase lettering and like they had the yeah. 90s colors and everything it made me miss like old ESPN2 before it became like super corporate obviously it had to grow up at some point but like right. it was just so funny to watch it and be like this was like the edgy sports channel right and it, Formula One got part of it which was hilarious to me now it's like the JV channel essentially yeah um, exactly but yeah back anytime I see the ES like ESPN and then the big two look like that looks oh, like yeah. it's been written in chalk <laughs> that's how it's like espn right here two yeah and uh that always gets me pumped up i know there's gonna be good nostalgia to follow whenever <laughs> yeah whenever I, mean, I see that logo <laughs> i'm a big fan of that one too but the biggest talking point in this whole race and i love how much they talked about outside the track issues and like drama and everything uh, and they still commentated the race which i think they did a really good job balancing but the amount of like silly season and even personal opinion that got worked into the broadcast was yeah. sick because we don't really see that much of it anymore. And great. Sky does a really good job. And like their pre-race show and post-race show does a good job of like talking about, um, you know, off track issues and changes, but like to do it during the middle of the broadcast was so yeah. bizarre to me, but I loved every second of it. Yeah. I'd love to hear Bob Varsha um, calling a race again. Obviously we haven't really heard that in the U S in a few years and um, you know, it's timely. Bob Varsha is in a pretty, pretty serious bout with cancer so it's cool to you know hear his voice and hear him do and COVID-19 oh that's right yeah it's like a double whammy um I didn't remember that while I was watching it but yeah yeah, Jesus I I think and I think we started watching this like right after something that came out about that but Mm -hmm. um I'm not sure what other broadcasts are out there but god I'm thankful that all these old races are available on YouTube I'm gonna do this even after the pandemic oh same I the more I watch it because like you um I don't, I try not to look at the racing reference beforehand just so I can kind of be surprised. I don't want to know how it plays out because, yeah. you know, I was six when this race happened. I don't, I didn't watch it. I don't remember it. Like I didn't, my Formula One, you know, watching career didn't start until 01. So like, it's still kind of like watching a new race essentially, even though I know yeah. I can look it up, but I don't want to. However, Williams. <laughs> Talk about a team. Yeah, exactly. You and I texted about this. Frank Williams is the Jack Roush of Formula One. Once Man. great, made a bunch of terrible strategic moves, and is now an also ran. And it's yeah. it's sad to see because they won a world championship that year, and they won a world championship that uh, – did they win it the next year? Now I can't even remember. I know Villeneuve won it in 1997, but I can't remember. I think Schumacher was back to it after that. Let's see. I've got just got to hit back Yeah, twice. yeah. Villeneuve was with Williams in 97. I couldn't remember it because then he moved to Honda and – Everything gets mixed up. Yeah, oh, and yeah. then 98, 99 was McLaren, and then the Schumacher reign started. Wait, 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 hold on. 
Hakkinen race for Ferrari in his second world championship? Did he? That's what it says on Racing Reference. In 1999? Nine? I said that kind of trashy. Nine. No, nine. nine. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, that's he what, that's what it said. Okay, that's he an error then. That's an error. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I bet they won the constructors. That's why. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah that's what it was. I yeah, just thought that was, was – yeah. All right, sorry. That was totally my bad. But anyways, back to what you were saying. Yeah, Williams, this is obviously in Williams' heyday. You know, the Senna left McLaren to go there. Um, they won multiple world championships. Uh, I mean, they were just – they were the, the most techni technically advanced team by far um, at that point. I was yeah. at 96 that those kind of topics were a little bit further down the list. But, man, yeah, just right – this is post, you know, Williams – uh, dominance era and they just I mean I that you have to think that that would have been one of their first in a string of very bad moves was dropping Damon Hill who was going to go I mean this was what race we were pretty far into the season here at this Monza. was race 14 to 16 yeah and also sh super short seasons back in the day 16 I know. races it feels like the race is shorter too it's a, I looked at the official race time an hour and 17 minutes on this race Monza always goes really quickly yeah. And then on the broadcast, too, like, they cut out the commercials. So, I felt like when I watched it, too, it went by so fast. Yeah, it really did. It really did. Uh, I, I love checking out the pre-race of these. So, once – I mean, there's literally as much pre-race coverage on these last two ones that we've watched as there are race coverage. And that's not – I'm not – that's not an insult. Oh, yeah. It's not a bad thing at all. Uh, but, yeah, Williams, you know, coming off – they won 12 of 16 races this year. Damon Hill is a 20-time Grand Prix winner – world champion gets dropped by Williams for 1997 in favor of Heinz Harold Frensen who had one podium finish uh, when he took over at Williams all because Williams believed that they needed a stronger driver lineup to compete against Ferrari and Schumacher. So they Villeneuve. hired a, a one-time podium finisher. Yeah. And Villeneuve's a rookie. So he won his world championship in his second year, which is impressive as hell, but like, the fact that you could still have had Damon Hill or even a David Coulthard Damon Hill pairing in 1996 and then a Villeneuve Hill pairing in 97 would still have been one of the strongest lineups yeah. out there. It's just mind boggling to me that like yeah. that they did this. It just doesn't make sense. And then to, you know, even get rid of Villeneuve and then it was just a series of just bad mistake after bad mistake for Frank Williams from that point on. I mean, I'm trying to even think now. The last Williams championship came in. It was I just had it. Pulled. 1997 it had to. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. when it was. And yeah, that's insane. I mean, tw I mean, we're talking what 23 years since Williams has been a world champion, which and that's a and that's a long, hard fall to do because you know they were. I mean, yeah. being not only a contender but a world champion F1, you know, that's reserved for the best of the best and they went from that to now basically and also ran until something changed i mean and and they were they had a, f a good fight a couple of years i mean in 14 15 maybe uh with with botas and felipe oh, massa yeah. and massa, i mean they, yeah, were, they were they were winning polls and put on the podium a handful of times and they that was their one bright spot yeah they probably should have stolen a race win at some point in there yep <sighs> It bums me out that Williams just isn't good anymore. It really is. I, I just watched between the last time we talked on Zoom and watching this, I watched the the what is it the second to the penultimate episode of the new season of F1 Drive to Survive on Netflix. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And that was all about Williams, and it was just it, it's sad to watch. It's so I genuinely sad. feel bad for him because you know they're keeping in the family, which I respect. Uh, Claire Williams. Didn't, I'm sure just get thrown in there randomly. Like there's a reason she's running the show now and they've got, you know, some sponsorship. And so anyways, we, we don't have to guess on what they need to do and stuff like that, but it, it right. just sucks to see their huge downfall. Or I mean, in 20, 2014, Valtteri Botas had one, two, three, four, five, six podium finishes, two second place finishes. Massa had a second place finish in Abu Dhabi um, that same year. And it's like, man, how do you go from that third in the constructor, third in the constructors again in 2015, to now back to back, back 10th place seasons? Jesus. I mean, last. I should have just said last. 
They haven't won a race since 2012 when Pastor Maldonado somehow pulled one out of his ass and won in Spain. <laughs> yeah. Still will be like the most bizarre race win that we see in a, in a long time. And then, ah, yeah. shit. Before that, they hadn't won since 2004 when Montoya won at Brazil. Jesus. God. Yeah. I mean, I, that, I feel bad for him. Yeah. It's an elongated. And you would think, I mean, I feel like they. I feel like if they – okay, this is going to sound stupid, but if they would have had Stroll somehow now for the money, obviously, and the whole, you know, Aston Martin connection and stuff, I feel like if they were to have Stroll now, they could be in really good position to just get a huge, you know, financial chunk of change backing them. Yeah. But whatever happened there, Stroll's no longer there. Um, so that money going to go somewhere else. competitive. Oh no, obviously, but yeah. they, they, like right now they've got a pay driver in there. They have Latifi now. I mean, he's a pay driver, right? Oh yeah. Oh, well, I mean, in a sense, George Russell, Russell is too because he's a Mercedes. Yeah, the whole Mercedes driver. Thing. Yeah, and the reason they have Mercedes sure. engines is because of this. Yeah, good point. I didn't really they think about just, the whole what, Russell part. What is happening back here? Yeah, this popcorn machine. Just every time I lean back, I keep hitting it. The notorious popcorn machine. Yeah, this fucking popcorn machine. Um. But yeah, so the Williams thing just makes no sense to me. And even just listening to Varsha and the guys calling the race question everything about it. And even like, I love the whole, they did the whole, no offense, but, you know, my Terrell Frenson isn't a great driver. And I mean this, like, no offense. no. Offense. And yeah. I love how they were like, just trying to play like PC with it, but also being like, uh, why? And then Frenson's comments before the race too. What did he like, say? Can't remember. Basically, that they just needed a younger, quicker driver. And it's like, Damon Hill's a world champion. <laughs> I don't... Like, he had a commanding lead with three races to go in the world yeah. championship. Like, that's just an outrageous move. Now, something else they talked about on this broadcast was driver salaries. And they spent a whole... Varsha spent a whole two, three minutes talking about how the old man, brackets, Enzo mm -hmm. Ferrari... Um, they're like, wonder what he would think. I think Schumacher must have just signed an extension or something, but um, said, you know, wonder what the old man would be thinking about Michael Schumacher and his uh, $25 million salary. Matter of fact, he just finished uh, building a brand new summer home in Mallorca, Spain. And, uh, you know, but they talked about that. And I'm surprised that they didn't bring up that aspect of the Damon Hill versus Heinz Harald Frensen, um, you know, not argument, but topic. Yeah. The how much they talked about Schumacher's salary throughout yeah. the race too, and they were like, "When well, you're making upwards of eighty million a year," and I was like, "Okay, we get it," but like he really was making so much money back in the day. Uh, a few months ago, like for whatever reason, those those like uh, those timeline graphs were like you know your salaries like they keep, they move over. Each other, you know what I'm talking about? Been seeing a lot of them with all the coronavirus stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They did one with uh, – uh, from 1970 to present in terms of athletes who made the most every year. And when Schumacher shoots up in the late 90s and early 2000s, he gaps every other athlete by, you know, 20 million a year. And then he, when boxing starts to get those huge paydays, they, they jump up. But, like, just to see him skyrocket and how much money he was making compared to everybody else – it's like I understand why his wife can pay a hundred thousand dollars a month in medical care for him. Like, yeah. it's just because they have. No, I don't want to say unlimited money, yeah. but like, you know, to quote Dave Portnoy, I have more money than God. Like, that's essentially what Schumacher has. To quote uh, Mike Ruck. Oh more yeah, money, more, more money, money than, than God. Than God, that's so funny. Or no, Portnoy said unlimited money. Yeah, he said he definitely yeah. said unlimited money. Yeah. Yeah, Ruck said more money than God. You're right. And then went on to talk about, and we'll get off this right away, but, and then went on to talk about how he wasn't going to fund his wife's ride. I mean, but whenever other people weren't, he said that they weren't believing in him or right, believing but her. It didn't make financial sense to fund his wife's ride, yeah. you know. And I was like, Marketing what are you genius. talking about? <laughs> yeah, you couldn't have made it any less sense. Um, no, the other thing I wrote down here was the track layout. I had completely yeah. forgotten the fact that the – the front stretch chicane was essentially a double chicane in 1996, almost like an S. If you look at it, it went 
and then yeah. into the parabolic or not parabolic, but into the what essentially would be the first corner. And now it's just I like the way it's set up now a lot more because it's a passing zone. We're back in the day in '96. It was more of just like uh, we need you to tap the brakes so that you can make it through here, yeah. and also so you don't enter turn one at you know 230 mile an hour. Right. Yeah. Which, See and. Seeing the fact that they line those with tires, I mean, that was a huge topic oh on the broadcast. God. That dangerous as hell. I mean, that would never happen today. Not ever. The fact that, like, the crazy part to me um, is the fact that every time they <laughs> would clip a tire, one of the spare tire, or not one of the spare, but one of the, you know, tire barrier tires would just roll across the track. On the first lap, they had two of them just rolling down um, towards Lesmo just together and it's like cars are dodging them schumacher hit them later in the race i was gonna say schumacher did yeah and i love the criticism too from the from the booth where they were like this is the pinnacle of motorsport and we have tire barriers out here with tires rolling across the track and it's like yeah so dangerous yeah that was a perfect i mean honestly that was just a brutally honest way to describe exactly what was going on and (laughs) it goes back to what you said earlier they were very uh, raw when it came to describing, you know, the happenings in the sport and the officiating. And um, they mentioned, I mean, they talked about Bernie up and down the whole, it was like, kind of reminded me of like a modern day, like, did he want them? To, he probably wanted them to be talking about him that much. Nothing against the guy, but I mean, he's an oh, idiot. Yeah. Um, um, the Bernie thing too. There was a quote that I texted you yeah. when I watched it too, where they were like, Formula One teams want to know what the commercial holder Bernie Ecclestone plans to do once he hangs up and like who owns the rights to these as he gets into his uh, 60s. And I was like, this dude didn't retire in 2016, I think. Like, Bernie was around forever. And, you know, if you would have told them 20 years ago that like, hey, listen, you're going to have to deal with this guy for another 20 years, they probably would have been pissed. Yeah. But, they talked about how Bernie doesn't like people on the track right away. Yeah. Uh, Bernie doesn't this. And it was just – they could have gotten to the exact same points today about, you know, FOM or, uh, li- sorry, Liberty Media, but um, but they would never describe them as directly as they did back then. No. I mean, it's the second the race ended and you could see, like, crews and fans, someone running on the track, Varsha's like, oh, Bernie, you know, Bernie doesn't like the team, doesn't like people on the track until all the cars are totally stopped. And it just sounded like it was very uh, pointed the way that they were talking about Bernie back then. Oh, definitely. It's almost like, Bernie Eccleston wanted to be like the Vince McMahon of Formula One. Like he liked to be the heel or like the bad guy because it gave him something to talk about. Right. And like, he's the all controlling, you know, head of Formula One. The other thing Varsha talked when you brought up that Bernie doesn't like people on the track. (laughs) Varsha did have a good point though. He was like, I don't know if all the cars have made it back to park for May yet as fans are like crowding the track. And there was like one quick shot of somebody trying to work through the crowd and I'm like, I can't imagine trying to drive an F1 car with a clutch that is so finicky because it's like the lightest yeah. clutch ever and has to try to weave in and out of people and not hit them. Like the fact that nobody died is absurd or even got hit is yeah. a miracle. Yeah, I, I noticed that clip too because I thought to myself when Bar said, I'm like, God, oh, he's right. There's no way all the cars are back around yet. Um, there was something else. Uh, we, we Monster fans something. also have a uh, history of – ripping like literally ripping body work off of abandoned cars on circuit and just like stealing engine covers and shit so like i'm sure that's another reason over there like can we try to get all the cars back so like we don't lose half this car now (laughs) yeah yeah you mentioned the monza fans and just monza in general i don't know if if i've ever seen a more picturesque f1 race i mean this beautiful august or excuse me september italian skies i mean places packed to the gills with people again ferrari i mean on their resurgence uh, but the crowd was into it. You know, you could hear the crowd just like you can today. Anytime really a Ferrari or, uh, or in this, in the case of the 96 edition of the Italian Grand Prix, uh, whenever a Lacey, you know, gave him something yeah. to share about too. So um, I, I think that's, you know, Monza's on everyone's bucket list for a reason, but just the atmosphere, man, it would have to be the reason why it's on my bucket list. Dude, it, the atmosphere at Monza, I'm glad that like it has literally never changed. It was batshit crazy in 96. It's still crazy in 2019 when Ferrari won there. Like, say what you want about Ferrari, and, like, we all will make fun of them, and they have too much power, and we know all that. Yeah. They're fans, though, and we even talked about this when Monza happened last year. Just the atmosphere, the fact that you can hear the fans cheer over the, the cars on circuit, 
just how, again, how passionate they are, the crowding of the track underneath the podium and everything like that. Also, seeing the podium over uh, pit lane instead of out over the front stretch as, like it is now was not weird, but it's like, oh, yeah, that never always existed. But everything about Monza just is so much fun. And, like, it's definitely on the bucket list of circuits that I think you have to make it to eventually. Yeah, it's uh, – that their current podium now is, I mean, just iconic to say the least. So, oh. you're right. I, and I didn't – I didn't know whatsoever that, that the podium hasn't always been there. But that's definitely a tradition that uh, cannot afford to go anywhere right now in F1. So, I think it's, uh, yeah, just a great tradition of, um, you know, just such great support. Oh, yeah. The other good part that Varsha brought up, too, he was like, generally, there's a uh, gentleman across the circuit shooting the podium. He's like, but I don't think he's able to get there. So that's why we're doing a live shot from the helicopter. And you could hear the helicopter in the live shot, too, which I also love because it was so, like, old school version of, like, a helicopter instead of now where, like, you know, they have the, the camera on the – Now, yeah. Yeah, the camera's on the bottom of the helicopter. It's rotating and everything like that. This was just one dude hanging out the side door with a, you know – yeah. a big ass tv camera shooting it which was awesome to see but yeah if you haven't watched the 96 italian grand prix definitely go back and do it just because ferrari returns to the top step of the podium schumacher goes back to back for the first time that season for him uh won at spa and then shows up and wins at monza uh and then just the coming and going the random like little things you'll hear during the race like they mentioned tyrell wanted to run front tires on all four sides of the car like they didn't want the they didn't want the wide rear tires. They wanted the skinny ones, and that's. I love that they're just like, um, you know, Firestone or Bridgestone engineers stepped in and were like, "You can't do that. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, we'll let you do everything else that you want to do, but that's too dangerous." Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. Picking up on the little technical bits that they drop uh, is great. You know, with a two man booth, it's kind of hard to get to some of them and get a full uh, explanation of anything that comes up technical. Now it was Varsha. I I can't blank it on who else called the race. I don't know who else called it with him. Um, they said his one, name. At one point, it sounded like Hobbs, but then another point, it sounded like Magic. It was like a – and I know it wasn't Magic because I think he was still in the pit lane at this point. But it was just like <laughs> – I don't want to, like, stereotype, but it sounded like every British Formula 1 presenter that we've heard, like, over the <laughs> last 15 years, and I'm just like, it could have been any of them. Right. It, it really could have. I can't remember, but they did. Whoever it was, man, that's blanking me who that was. But whoever it was did a really good job. Uh, Schumacher – Schumacher had went through and hit the tires, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, at one of the chicanes. And in the 1996 slow-mo, you could see the, the, the tire flex. I can't remember which, how to describe which way it flexed. But just for a split second in the slow-mo, and the second commentator reacted to that. And they went back and showed it in slow-mo. And yeah, it, it was pretty considerable. And I actually, I thought Schumacher's day was done at that point. Um, yeah, Obviously, so does they too, which I thought was awesome because they were like, "There's no way he can make it there," and it's yeah. like he just that's that's like the most typical Schumacher thing ever. Like he fucks up and still manages to turn it into into gold. Like the guy could yeah. just do no wrong when he was with Ferrari at that point. Um, One by twenty seconds. I mean, yeah, <laughs> or eighteen, eighteen point yeah. two. Still, and I mean, like, and he, that was built over half the race, not even over the full race at that. Because um, he didn't get in front of the Lacey until the pit stops. All right, what are we watching next? Uh, good question. Um, you want to mention what our plan for next oh, week? Oh yeah, as well? yeah. I completely blanked on that because I was like, "That's not happening for another week." Um, if anybody has listened to the Copy That Mate podcast, um, or if you haven't listened to it, go check it out now because you have plenty of free time. They're going to be on with us uh, next week, so we won't have a video next week because we'll be waiting until sunday to record when all of those guys have yeah. time to do it um but we are going to be watching the 2005 japanese grand prix love it it's on youtube there's two versions of it so if one gets taken down we know we have a backup <laughs> um but yeah i'm excited for that uh we already know who wins but i'm not going to tell everybody i'm excited to get those guys on and then we can have a four-way zoom call really push our limits of technology here and see what we can what we can do uh, with the YouTube video and everything like that. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, ben and I went to college together, uh, fraternity brothers. We literally lived in the same house at, at some point. And um, <laughs> like neither of us really even knew that the other was into racing. So we hardly ever talked about it. Um, but good dude. Yeah, pretty, pretty excited to talk some F1 with him because I 
never have really before. So um, it's going to be cool. But yeah, great, great dude. I want to say he lives down in Texas now, but yeah, check out their uh, podcast, follow them on Twitter. They actually do a really good job with Twitter, I feel like. Um, yeah, they do. So, you know, even if you somehow don't have the time to listen to their show, definitely uh, throw them a follow on Twitter. They're uh, knowledgeable, fun guys. But yeah, looking for, I mean, Suzuka's always been top two, three track for me. So uh, unfortunately, I do know who wins too, but yeah, looking forward to that uh, 2005 Japanese Grand Prix. Um, I want to mention one more thing about this one. Yeah. A pretty damn solid run for Martin Brundle in fourth. I'm not sure if I heard his name one time on the whole broadcast. Um, <laughs> I but he came home either. fourth. And for a guy who says he was uh, as good, if not better, than Senna, however he, however he worded it, um, that's not bad. <laughs> and he beat his teammate, the young spry Rubens Barrichello. But another not terrible run for – uh, Versa- Yoss Verstappen as well. I mean, he finished a lap down in eighth, which wasn't in the points back then, but I feel like coming home eighth in a footwork car is uh, is definitely something to hang your hat on. The footwork heart car, you know. <laughs> the esteemed heart 830. You know, Folks are still talking about that engine today. <laughs> to that engine, and then the FA17, that's a, you know, renowned chassis that everybody pays attention to. Uh, going through here, Pedro Lamy and the Minardi car retired would have been what p13 i just like seeing his name on here gerhard berger still going around olivia panice they're still just really good and then you just have the random ones again where you're like giovanni lavaggi from yeah Mary. like what yeah who <laughs> uh, Kadiyama. like what yeah ricardo Rosset, uh the brazilian driving the other footwork car it's just these random guys that show up in Formula One, but I, I love everything about the most random people. Oh. Yeah, and, and you may know better than I. Did they have? I mean, were some of these guys pay drivers? Why haven't I seen? I yeah, we they seen were their name ever. Definitely pay drivers. Okay. Even back then, um, I got to see if 2005 had one of my favorite drivers in it. Hang on. Christian Albers. Oh, can I get? Can I? Well, don't tell me. I want to guess. Are no, you said 2005. Yeah, he he wasn't. He had already left by 2005, which bums me out. So do I go to 2004 to look and guess? Um, uh, let me see, because I can't remember when he was a real flash in the pan. Oh yeah, you can go to 2004 and look. He's there. All right, let's see here. Give me the standings. I don't care about the. You think he started every race? I'm just gonna click on a random race. In 2004, he did. Yeah. Okay, let's go to Indianapolis. Okay. Uh, whoever Baumgartner. Oh yeah, <laughs> you got is he Hungarian? Baumgartner. Oh yeah. I said that's a the a first time I've ever seen a Hungarian flag in anything related to racing. Oh yeah, Zolz Baumgartner. Other than the race itself, but uh, one season, one and done in Formula One, scored one championship point at uh at the USGP actually. Um, nice. Yeah, I. I just remember being like, yeah, 14 and waking up every morning and my dad and I would always cheer for Zolz Baumgartner just as hope that he would sometime finish in the points. And when he did, we were like, holy shit. It was much like the, uh, the super Aguri team scoring points um, in Canada that one year and everybody freaked out. Yeah. It's funny to see some of those guys like there, you have the class of, I've noticed there's definitely a a class of each driver falls into a category. They're either the flesh in the plan, like Baumgartner or Lavaggi or whoever was in uh in this 1996 race I'm, I'm off on racing reference then you have I mean you have obviously the stars who are stars everywhere Schumacher I mean he won multiple things uh you know the Montoyas of the world then you have like the journeyman and that's the mm-hmm. class where I would put like Barrichello truly uh Berger almost Gerhard Berger uh you could put uh Frenson in that uh, there's another one I just saw. Oh, Fisichella is somebody. They're just journeymen. They've raced for every, like, okay team. Had a, you know, a shot. You know, like, yeah, I don't know if you want to call Fisichella filling in for Luca, whatever, in 2009 at Ferrari, a shot. But, like, they've kind of had a little bit of a moment in the sun. And, like, oh, with yeah. Truly, like for Toyota, you know, factory team, ran pretty well in 09. Um, I watched that whole 2009 three-hour recap. Oh, did you? Good. I feel, uh, I, feel, I feel like that year and the results have – more importance than they actually did did you see uh yeah that 2000 luca badois as you were talking about Badois. Okay. yeah um for 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 being the ferrari test driver forever that man had zero race pace 
Yeah, like, oh, he was God. so bad. When and, like, they talked about like, his woes, I was like, I feel awful for the guy. I think uh, Valencia, which was the European Grand Prix in 2009, I think that was the race that they were all like, where the Ferrari pit wall just got fed up with him. Because I remember okay. watching that race and him just being like, nothing wrong with the car, ran like 15th. And it's like, dude, yeah. you can't be this bad. Like, there's no way. Yeah, that's very bad. Especially when like Kimmy won a couple of races, or at least a race that year. Um, and he, this yeah, is the same car. Spa and uh, Monza, I believe. Yeah. Who was, uh, there was, I thought of another good journeyman. Oh, you could put Verstappen in that. I mean, again, I, I was totally undersold on his uh, career just because I'd never actually watched a full race with him in it. Um, I just knew that he wasn't really like a winner. So I kind of wrote him off, but man, he's held his own in these two races that we've watched. I mean, that's a five-year difference there too, between 96 and 01. Good math. Yeah. (laughs) Congrats to you. Um, Yeah. He's a scrapper. I'll give him that. Like he, he definitely made it last. Um, so yeah, follow us on Twitter, Zach at Zach Miles Two, myself, Apex Off. It's below our lovely faces here. Um, the blog, ApexOff.com, the podcast, Break Hard Podcast, you can find on all major podcast networks. Uh, we didn't do one this week just because, like, it was an I race. We didn't have weirdly being stuck in quarantine, we didn't have time to really knock one out this week. Uh, but we'll get back to it and then. You know, the next video we have will be with the copy that make guys and uh, 2005 Japanese Grand Prix. Yeah. And if anybody's listening and wants to see something or wants to see us review a race, we, you know, our inbox isn't full. Yes. <laughs> so um, <laughs> if you have any ideas, give them to us. Uh, yeah. Looking forward Just to watching. Make sure it's on YouTube. Things. Correct. Yeah. Need that. All right. We'll talk to you guys next week. Later.